Hi, this is Duncan Ferguson. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the management of complicated diabetes mellitus, focusing on diabetic ketoacidosis, and a little bit on hyperosmolar coma, uh, primarily in dogs and cats. And uh, we'll talk about the short-acting insulin products and the other aspects of therapy, uh, including aggressive fluid and electrolyte therapy. The clinical signs of complicated diabetes mellitus include anorexia, dehydration, depression, and vomiting. And this can be seen in both diabetic ketoacidosis and in hyperosmolar coma. So these signs together with your biochemical parameters, which we'll talk about, are key to the diagnosis. It's important to talk a little bit about um, what ketone bodies are because they are fundamentally a sign of very poor diabetic control. And when an animal that had been previously stable um, or normal, perhaps, perhaps an infection can be a stimulus for the uh, alteration of insulin resistance. And this is because uh, you can have abnormality of neutrophil function, white monocyte and lymphocyte function in diabetes. And of course, the animal is prone to infection because of the elevated glucose. The other possibility is that you can have an increase in stress hormones like, glu um, like glucagon, uh, corticosteroids, et cetera, growth hormone that will lead to uh, an enhancement of insulin resistance and lead the animal to be out of uh, diabetic control. Um, I list here the three basic uh, keto ketone bodies, acetone, acetoacetic acid, and beta-hydroxybutyric acid, and we'll talk about measuring those a little bit later. So if our main metabolic problems in uh, DKA are dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, metabolic acidosis, and hyperglycemia, our treatment starts with looking, as part of your diagnostics, is looking for an underlying problem that you can treat, such as an infection, if that's, if that's not identifiable, then you proceed, of course, either way. Uh, in order of priority, replacement of body fluids, so fluid therapy, including appropriate electrolyte and acid-base therapy, and we'll talk about that. And then the reduction of blood glucose. Uh, the use of uh, fluids themselves will reduce blood glucose to begin with, and then addition of insulin, of course, will help to uh, start clearing the um, ketone bodies and and also reduce the glucose. So of course the, the initial diagnostic plan is to get a minimum database, CBC, biochemical profile, and urinalysis. And it's important to collect this blood before you start treatment so you can have a very clear picture where the animal starts uh, before you start altering uh, electrolytes, fluid balance, and glucose particularly. Um, with the therapy. Just to run through some of the typical findings that you'd have in a, in a DKA patient, uh, you can have an hematocrit that can be high, normal, or low. Often you'll have a mature neutrophilia or a left shift if there's a possibility of infection or stress, and you can have decreased uh, platelet aggregation and diminished fibrinolytic activity. Of course, in serum biochemistries, uh, focusing first on glucose and sodium, uh, you have hyperglycemia, sort of the definition of diabetes, uh, if it's per persistent. Uh, and plasma sodium can be increased, normal, or decreased. And here's some of the reasons for that. In diabetes, of course, water is lost in excess of sodium uh, during a polyuric uh, condition. Um, but you can also have uh, an excretion of keto acids as sodium salts, and then that it, together with the lack of insulin and the transfer of water from the intra to the extracellular space can actually decrease sodium concentrations. And insulin, it should be noted that um, the reason for the insulin effect, lack of effect, is that normally insulin increases tubular reabsorption of sodium. A very important parameter to get a handle on right away is plasma potassium, and it can be normal, high, or low. But regardless of its plasma concentration, you should assume that the body stores a potassium in an animal that has been vomiting, um, perhaps not eating well, 
um, that the body stores for potassium are probably depleted. And since the vast majority of potassium is intracellular, uh, you should be cautious about uh, considering that the animal might be actually um, hyperkalemic when, in fact, it's probably just had its potassium translocated to the extracellular space. How does that happen? Well, acidosis uh, through the plasma membrane hydrogen and potassium exchange may lead to an increased plasma potassium concentration. So supplementation is usually indicated, but we usually start without assuming anything and often start with a potassium deplete solution such as 0.9% sodium chloride, or you can even use uh, lactated ringers because it has low potassium. The uh, sodium itself will stimulate the membrane sodium potassium ATPase and lead to reuptake uh, of potassium into the cell. And the acidosis, when it resolves, you will also see the, the potassium situation start to show in the plasma what is truly the body status of potassium. And when it's low, uh, of course, the, the problems with low potassium hypokalemia include muscle weakness, paralytic ileus, and cardiac arrhythmia. Of course, in acidosis, um, bicarbonate may be low or extremely low, and the anion gap increased. The anion gap is the uh, difference between the main positive cation, sodium and potassium, subtracting from that chloride and bicarb. Uh, hypophosphatemia is often seen in a condition of ketoacidosis, that so can lead to severe, um, can lead to hemolytic anemia in severe cases. And together with that is hypomagnesemia. So over time, the uh, after you get the everything else stabilized uh, and the animal on insulin and the potassium normalized, etc., you start looking about refining your therapy by possibly giving um, phosphate and magnesium. Other biochemical abnormalities seen in uh, DKA include increased liver enzymes usually a pre-renal azotemia that is due to dehydration and due to the lack of insulin, hypertriglyceridemia, hypercholesterolemia, sometimes an increased amylase and lipase depending on whether you have uh, coexisting pancreatitis. Now, I said I'd talk about ketone bodies. Uh, it's important to note that ketone strips, keto strips, measure only acetoacetate and acetone. And they do not measure beta-hydroxybutyrate. And this is key because uh, later in treatment, you'll find that uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate levels are actually increased uh, briefly. And it'll seem like the ketone body situation is getting worse when actually you're simply starting to resolve ketosis. Uh, serum levels are more sensitive than measurement in the urine. And, and note that even though they're not done that often, they can measure beta hydroxy and that's one of the advantages of using serum measurements although using uh, keto strips um, at the beginning as a diagnostic test will help you diagnose uh, the presence of ketoacidosis and uh, as basically you get greater oxidation of these products to beta hydroxybutyrate uh, and then we may suggest that they are in fact, uh, things are getting worse, but in fact, they're getting better. Uh, and so using keto strips at the beginning to measure acetoacetate and acetone uh, diagnostically, uh, starting treatment, and then basically ignoring the ketone body measurements um, in the urine, at least, uh, is, is a pretty typical thing to do.